This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 2nd, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, our initial take on what BP's sale to Hillcorp will mean for Alaska. Second, another op-ed in support of cutting the PFD, or put another way, another effort to save the top 20% from paying for government. And third, at a federal level, the Tea Party appears to be fading to black just at the time it is needed most. And now, let's join Michael. The big news in Alaska is, of course, uh, the purchase of BP uh, by Hillcorp, uh, which is the end of an era, right? I mean, is that where we're at? It is the end of, the, of an era. It's the beginning of, a, of another. Uh, but I think it's right to sit here to, to take a moment and observe the end of the era. Some people will, will complain about BP. I mean, I've heard it, you've heard it, and, and likely both of us have done it from time to time. But we need to recognize what, what happened during BP's tenure uh, 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 over Prudhoe. Prudhoe, when it was originally found, was estimated to have 9.4 billion barrels of recoverable reserves. During the course of Prudhoe's life to this point, uh, as a result of, frankly, a heck of a lot of investment, a heck of a lot of, of engineering and, and, and geologic know-how and, and, and work, uh, that's been extended. That $9.4 billion has been in, or 9.4 billion barrels has been increased to 13 barrels, billion barrels of, uh, of estimated recoverable reserves. That, to, to put that in perspective, uh, it's moved it from 40% recovery of the of the initial oil in place to 60% recovery of, of initial oil in place. That's a that's a huge huge increase uh, that you don't commonly find in the oil industry. To put that in some perspective, if we try to calculate what that means in terms of additional time, what BP's efforts, BP and, and Arcos in the old days, and BP and Conoco and Exxon in the current in the current era. Uh, what that would do, what, what, what that means in terms of additional time, if we took uh, the current production rate from Prudhoe, which is still about 225 million barrels a day, slightly less than half of total per production from the North Slope, and divided that into that additional uh, 3.6 billion barrels, what they've done by, by increasing the recovery rate is extend the life of Prudhoe by 39 years using, using the current production rate. That's huge. I mean, the, 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 the investment of time and knowledge and, and experience has, has hugely benefited Alaska by, by increasing, uh, increasing production uh, or increasing the life of the field. They're, they're, they're leaving it with still an estimated uh, 1 billion barrels a day. Uh, and that is, again, using the same divisor, the, the current production rate from Prudhoe, that's an additional 10 years of production. Uh, that the field still has in it uh, at, at current production rates. So it's the, the, having a major and majors involved in the development of the field, I think, has greatly benefited Alaska uh, in terms of having the engineering know-how and the deep pockets it took to develop uh, the field and to find and, and to and to find uh, ways to, uh, to additionally bring on additional reserves, extend the life of the field, increase the recovery 
uh, of the field uh, uh, since since its discovery. Now, in, in, in addition to that sort of knowledge, know-how, and deep pockets, uh, I think BP, I think most people recognize, if you read the articles, most people are saying that BP has, has contributed heavily to the community, uh, both in terms of charitable giving and in terms of its involvement and the time of its executives and, and employees uh, in the community. And I think another thing that BP has brought to the game uh, that, that we're in danger of not having as, as great, a, great an expertise on is LNG. Now, we haven't, we haven't delivered on LNG. We haven't delivered on monetization of gas. Uh, and that's unfortunate, but BP has a global view and a global presence that I think has helped push the LNG project along and, and in the old days push the, the gas line to the lower 48 along farther than, I, than it would have been uh, without having, having a major involvement. Those, those, are, those are huge delivery uh, uh, factors. Um, but, I, but, but, but that's so, so we're ending that era. Of, of those sorts of deliveries in terms of understanding knowledge, deep pockets, investment, uh, chari- community and charitable giving, and LNG expertise. Well, and we're those, starting. We're starting on. We're starting off on a new on a new direction. Well, and those changes, I think, again, you know, the 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 companies change how they do business. They change things, and what's happened is, you know, as my reading comes to it, and I want your commentary on this because you're the expert. But my reading on this is that BP is now moving more into the ideal of some of these older, established, uh, they want to go out and do no, uh, more exploration, and Hillcorp is known for squeezing every drop of oil and gas out of smaller, marginal, or even older fields that just thought that they you know, were thought to be on their deathbed, so to speak. That's kind of what they specialize in, and it's, so it's really kind of specialize or die kind of thing, right? Is that is that how I'm reading it? The, the oil industry is specialize or die. Uh, and BP is moving on uh, to shale development. They made a, a huge acquisition, double the size of the of the sales price uh, of Prudhoe to to Hillcorp. Made a huge acquisition last year of um, of BHP's position, BHP. It's an Australian company's position uh, in the shale in the Permian Basin, Haynesville, and, and elsewhere uh, in the South Central region. BP acquired that. Uh, they're beginning to make a substantial investment in it. This is sort of a, from their perspective, global perspective, this is sort of a swap out of, of an older field that is in decline, uh, uh, that takes a lot of investment to keep it going, uh, in case it takes a lot of expertise and takes a lot of people and a lot of management attention to keep it going. It's a swap out of that for the ability to move that management focus and attention and investment uh, over to what they view as a rising uh, potential with the uh, with the BHP properties in uh, in Texas and Louisiana and uh, and Oklahoma. So yeah, and and Hillcorp has exactly the reputation uh, that you're ascribing to it, and that'd be a good thing. I mean, we may, as I say, the estimation is on Prudhoe that we've got an additional uh, one billion barrels uh, remaining. That's ten years of current production rates. Hillcorp uh, comes in. Uh, and and they may be able to, to to find another 250 million barrels, or maybe they find another 500 million barrels. Each 250 million barrels would extend that life another 2.5 years. So, if they're able to come in and and find an additional 250 million or recoverable 250 million barrels or 500 million barrels, that's uh, over what BP was going to do. That's an additional 2.5 to, to five years of production. But that comes that's going to come at a cost. Sure. And 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 the reason the reason that Hillcorp's very good at that is is because they change the economics. BP has a big uh, uh, structure, has a big overhead, uh, has big costs. Uh, they do safety and redundancies. Uh, Hillcorp comes Hillcorp comes in and has a much lower cost structure. Uh, they uh, don't have the administrative overhead that BP has. They don't do the redundancies that that BP does. They don't have the engineering uh, 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 research facilities uh, that BP does, and so they come because they come in with a much lower cost structure. The economics on making additional investments are different than BP's. You have to have you have to have a big return to to pay for that cost structure that BP has in order to justify bringing an in investment. Because of the lower cost structure, uh, uh, Hillcorp doesn't need. 
the same sort of, of prospect return uh, in order to justify additional investment. So we should see uh, additional investment coming in above and beyond uh, what what BP was was going to make based upon the economics, and that additional investment and their 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 focus on mature fields and their ability to bring expertise on mature fields should result in not only the recovery of the additional billion barrels out of Prudhoe that people think are there, but also uh, increasing the recovery factor by some margin by making additional investments that BP otherwise wouldn't have. That also but it's going to come at a cost of it's, it's going to come at a cost of lowering. Uh, lowering their commitment and their expenditures on community and charitable giving, for example. And they're not going to bring the same sort of drive, same sort of expertise and investment on the LNG side that we had with BP. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're talking about the purchase of BP uh, Alaska by uh, Hill Corp. Uh, it also means some changes for the state. I saw that, uh, you know, first and foremost, uh, somebody tripped up on the idea that because Hill Corp is an LLC and not a C Corp, uh, the state's going to lose some revenue. There's also the question of charitable giving and some other things. There's going to be some real changes as we move forward. And as you just mentioned, because their structure is completely different, BP has 1,600 employees in the state of Alaska. Hill Corp is probably going to do things a little bit differently, and there will probably be a significant change in personnel and everything else and all the things that they do. Yeah, I uh, again, to get their cost to, to – to achieve their economic objectives, they've got to get costs down. And to, and one of the big uh, drivers in costs certainly is people. And I expect that's that's one place we'll see reductions. Another driver of costs is community and charitable, uh, community activities and charitable giving. I expect we'll see a we'll see a, a drop in that. One thing that I haven't seen written about in the press a lot yet, uh, and that I think um, uh, listeners. Uh, will benefit knowing is this is going to go through this acquisition goes through a state approval process, and I'm old enough, and 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 others may be old enough to remember back to the last time we had a major transaction on the slope, which was BP's acquisition of Arco uh, in 1999. That that as a result of the state's involvement uh, and state approval process, drug into 2000, and the state took its time as it has the right to do. Reviewed a number of uh, a number of issues, uh, whether BP was going to make the same sort of an investment that that you could have expected Arco to make, and some other things, and that resulted ultimately in 2000 in a document called the Charter for the Development of the Alaska North Slope between BP ConocoPhillips and uh, and, uh, and and the state. So there's going to be there's going to be a review process that I think uh, brings to light a number of these issues. One big issue that's going to be subject to the review process is who's going to be responsible. Who's, who's got the responsibility for the ultimate decommissioning of the Prudo of the Prudo facilities. At some point, Prudo plays out. Uh, and the question is who's on the hook to pay for the dismantlement and restoration uh, of those facilities. Um, and, and BP is one person. BP has got hugely deep pockets. Hill Corp's a, a different animal. Um, and if 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 you if you have somebody that doesn't have financial capability to do the DRNR, uh, then the state is on the hook. <laughs> so the government's on the hook <laughs> to come in and do the cleanup. So there'll be a lot of issues that 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 need to be reviewed during the course of the approval process. And of course, that was part of the at least in the initial agreement as well, and everything else. I imagine there'll be escrow accounts set up and all kinds of crazy things. But this thing is not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a year before the whole thing finally comes to. Uh, comes to an end, but there will be big changes for the state of Alaska. So I guess we'll be, we'll be watching that and, uh, and we'll be getting more information from you as things kind of progress and, and picking your brain on that as well. Good morning to everybody that's joining us in the chat room. Thanks for coming and joining us. Um, Tim says, Brad, let's all be blunt. Giving to the communities are all taxpayer funded. And I think what Tim is referencing there is of course, the tax incentives, tax breaks, tax credits that have been going on for years, um, although some of those are more directed to the smaller players and not necessarily BP uh, directly. But, uh, yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's, that can, that's the kind of the feeling of a lot of Alaskans. Sure, they can give things away. They can give away $4 because they're getting $1.2 billion in tax breaks. That's what we're hearing. 
Oh, I think that's uh, I think that's overblown. I think that approach is overblown. Uh, the taxes, at least the the 2013 taxes, uh, SB 21, w- were set in a way to uh, sort of revenue maximize, to extract the amount, maximum amount of of revenue you could out of the oil properties without uh, pushing investment to other other regions. Uh, the community giving uh, to a, a company the size of BP is sort of at the margin. Yeah, that probably pay, pay, plays a bit into the analysis of of, uh, of you know what the tax rate can be in order not to push them away. Uh, there's a little bit of concern about uh, about you know their level of community giving and should the tax rate be a little bit lower in order to accommodate that level of community giving. But we're really we're really at the noise level. Uh, in those in those sorts of numbers, it's more uh, it's more th- the approach of the company, uh, of the size of the company, and the and the philosophy of the company uh, to the region. I think BP, for example, uh, when it goes into a new re- region, Angola, Kazakhstan, or any major, when they go into a new region, uh, do a lot to establish community presence. It's part of it's part of their way of of making everybody comfortable with an oil company coming in. Uh, and doing uh, development. So it's a sort of common for a major company to do that. Right. Hearts and minds, hearts and minds, so to speak, uh, you know, in, in kind of inveigling themselves into the community to be part of it because they're going to be there for a while. So that's uh, that's what yeah, needs to happen. And, it's, and, it's, and you build up goodwill so that if you have a, have a situation like BP did in 2006 with the the spill on the slope and the and the shutdown uh, that occurred, the, the, the days-long shutdown that occurred, uh, as a result of those activities, you build up goodwill so that when you have that, uh, you, uh, you you can draw on that reservoir of goodwill. Um, Hillcorp just, I mean, the, the smaller independents, particularly the private independents, that's one thing about Hillcorp. It's not a public company, so there's no there's no SEC reporting and other things. Uh, they, they tend to be much more uh, profit-oriented. They tend to be much more bottom-line-oriented um, and tend not to have the same since they're not the first movers in a country, they tend not to have the same sort of, as you put it, hearts and minds approach. Um, so you just see a different philosophy coming out of those companies. Right. It doesn't mean that they don't have giving because they, I mean, they've talked about their giving campaigns and things and stuff like that. But it may not be four, $4 million dollars worth, which, uh, of course, has got a lot of the nonprofits in the state of Alaska on pins and needles. Which, again, just reminds me um, that there seems to be a little bit of a... And maybe this is just my my take on it. A little bit of more of a nonprofit industry mentality in this state than in many other states. In fact, our 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 we have a, per capita seem to have a lot more of that going on with dependence on private giving and and government giving in a lot of ways. Yeah, and we're going to see a boomerang effect of that, Michael. I mean, as we shift from from BP's community and charitable activities to to sort of a new paradigm with Hillcorp's. Um, uh, community and, and charitable activities, we're going to see a lot of those nonprofits say, "Well, the state needs to up its game <laughs> in order to support our activities. We're important, you know. We're critical. We, right. We have to have this money, and we're going to see the pressure on on legislators to to either maintain or increase giving uh, to those sorts of activities. So, it, it we're, this is this is this is going to play out uh, in a number of different ways." Uh, with a number of different uh, knock-on effects that, uh, that I'm not sure any of us can even get our arms around yet. But it's that one. That one in particular will have a boomerang effect on state spending. Um, let's uh, tease the next uh, of the weekly top three. This is number two, and we're going to talk a little bit about how the PFD uh, is, uh, you know, is still there. I mean, we still have the formula. We still have the statutory amount, and uh, oh yeah, everybody's saying we still need to change the formula. And that seems to be because what we really can't do is reduce the spending uh, and that the top 20 percent doesn't really want to pay for the changes. Uh, Give us a tease for that going into the next segment here. Well, we've got our next installment of the of the now seemingly uh, semi monthly uh, commentaries from Larry Persley. Um, uh, it's a, an opinion piece in the in the ADM. The title of it: "If it's time, it's time for a new PFD formula." And and these have really boiled into a formula which says, "Look, we can't afford the PFD. We've got to cut it down, uh, and uh, and we've got to find ways to do that." Um, and it's just, I mean, it's it's turned into sort of these 
semi-monthly uh, 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 attacks on the PFD. Ultimately, what, the, what, that's, what those attacks really are is their top try, uh, and we can explain it uh, after the break, but it's ultimately really tying to trying to protect the top 20% from having to pay a proportionate share of the cost of government. I think that what we're getting is a peek behind the curtain here into their mindset and their mantra, which is essentially, we just can't stop spending. We just can't stop. We we'll, won't stop. Never stopping is kind of uh, the mantra so far of the uh, of the big spending crowd in the state of Alaska. And I think that's kind of the, the whole point here, Brad, is we've become so dependent on this government largesse at many levels, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, through charitable, you know, the charitable organizations or programs or contractors who've become dependent on that state spending as part of their business model, we just can't stop. We just can't stop the state lucre. Yeah, let's sort of let's sort of set the stage. FY the FY twenty budget uh, at, at the end of the second uh, round of vetoes uh, is the spending is about, uh, and this is unrestricted general fund is about $4.2 billion. That actually is, is, is sort of, um, it sort of masks what the real spending is. For example, it has virtually zero in there for the capital budget. They funded the state's portion of the capital budget largely out of DGF designated general funds as opposed to UGF. But, but let's just take UGF at, at face value and say it's $4.2 billion. That's what it, that's what it adds up to. Revenues, uh, counting oil, counting uh, uh, other taxes, existing taxes, and, and some small investment income, and then counting the, the share we draw after the statutory PFD, revenues are $3.3 billion. So we've got a $900 million hole. This is after all the, 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 the gnashing of teeth and the, and the clanging of drums and the, and the, the marches and the recall petitions. We've still got a nine hundred million dollar hole, and I think I think what you see in, in Larry Persley's column, what you see in other columns that are showing up in the media now, uh, it, it's not uh, it's not cut that cut, cut spending further, get us closer to what to what uh, to what uh, revenues are, get, get that nine hundred million dollars uh, down. It's not that. It's it's a it's a battle now about who's going to pay for that for that nine hundred million dollar. Uh, shortfall and the shortfalls. When you look when you look out ten years, the shortfalls that just continue and continue and continue and continue uh, over that ten year ten year period. And basically, what these articles about the PFD are about: we need to change the PFD, we need to cut the PFD, we can't afford the PFD. Whatever whatever format they're coming in, is basically the top twenty percent. Uh, who, who would pay very little, pays very little under PFD cuts. It's basically the top 20% coming in and saying, don't look at us. Don't talk about taxes that, that we would have to pay. Uh, uh, don't uh, 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 think that you're going to get any money out of us. Where we, need to, where we need to go get the money is out of middle and lower income Alaska families uh, by cutting the PFD. So we're, we're in a phase of the battle. I think you're right, Michael. I mean, you don't see any articles. Uh, in the media, you don't hear any commentary in the media about about cutting that nine hundred million dollars down further. What you're what you're hearing is who pays that nine hundred that nine hundred million dollars, and what you're seeing in all these PFD articles of the top twenty percent saying, "Uh, uh-uh, don't tax us, don't tax, don't don't tax you, don't tax me. Tax that guy behind the tree." <laughs> with the guy behind the tree being middle and lower income Alaska families that are that are uh, benefited by the PFD. Get out of my head. I was just going to say that. I remember that old cartoon from the from the early early 20th century here in the US. Don't tax me, don't tax, you know, don't tax you, don't tax me. Tax the man behind the tree. It's always somebody else paying the bill. The bottom line is we're all paying it in one form or another, but the 20% at this point are avoiding all of that stuff because again, they've got their fingers in a lot of pies and they're feeling uh, that pinch, and they just want to continue to keep that spending going, uh, regardless of the cost overall to average everyday Alaskans. Well, they want to keep the. They want two things. They want to keep the spending going, but they don't want to pay for it. I mean, PFD cuts. We put this. We put these numbers up often, so uh, uh, those who go to the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page will find them by just paging down a little bit. But but at fourteen hundred at at a fourteen hundred dollar PFD cut, uh, uh, the the top twenty percent, the average top twenty percent family 
will pay 1.6% of their income uh, in terms of, of, of PFD cuts. The median Alaska family, the median average uh, Alaska family will pay 5.2%. The middle uh, uh, income segment will pay 6.8%, and the lowest 20% will pay 20.5% of their income in, in, in terms of PFD tax. So when you look at the top 20%, they're getting away with paying 1.6% pushing 5.2% off on the median, 6.8% off on the middle income, and 20.5% on the lowest income. They've got a good deal, and they don't want it. <laughs> and so they get spending. They get all the government services. They have to pay very little for it, and they get middle and lower income Alaska families to pay for it. We're gonna, That's going to be the continued push out of the top 20%. And the thing to keep in mind is 80% of the legislature – is from the top 20%. Yeah. So it's not it's not only external uh forces, uh the top 20% out there in the donor class and out there in the in the in the uh uh, uh in the economic community that's pushing this. The legislators themselves have an incentive, a personal incentive uh to keep the to keep the burden on PFD cuts uh because it reduces uh, their income. For example, uh, the average Senate income, the average income of a of, of a senator currently in the Alaska legislature, is three hundred ninety one thousand dollars a year. That's their average annual income. PFD cuts is a two percent uh, a two percent uh, tax on them. Their constituents, though, the average constituent, it's a five point three percent tax on the average constituent. It's it's a benefit to the um, uh, to the to the to the legislators themselves. Uh, to keep the focus on uh, PFD cuts. So that's that's what we're going to continue to see, a push by the top 20%. They don't want to close it. There's no talk of cutting of cutting another $900, 000, $900 million out of state spending. They want to push that off. They want to keep the spending, and they want to push off the burden on middle and lower income Alaska families. We've got about three minutes here, and that takes us to number three, which, again, it just proves that this is not just a state problem. This is a national problem. You wanted to talk about the Tea Party. It's needed now more than it ever was even in 2009. Where did it go? What happened? I mean, what happened to that? <laughs> yeah, they've disappeared. I mean, the Republicans that got elected in 2010, to the extent they're still around in Congress, are the ones voting for the tax tax cuts that didn't pay for themselves, put us a, a billion three into, into deficit over the next 10 years. They're the ones voting for the the 2018 and now the 2019 spending bills. The 2019 spending bill alone adds $1.7 billion to the deficit. Trillion the dollars. Trillion but dollars. They disappeared. Trillion dollars, right? Not $1.7 Trillion dollars. I'm sorry. Yeah. So the numbers yeah. are so big you can't even wrap your brain around it. But, yeah, that's the thing. And many of those Tea Party Republicans – are not even in office anymore. I mean, it just it's just, you know, it's like it was a flash in the pan. They came in saying fiscal responsibility got everybody's attention, and then the Republicans as a whole just kind of business as usual did it, and there we go. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, it, it comes home to roost. Uh, uh, Don Young voted for uh, those two spending bills and voted for the tax cuts. He's voted for uh, increasing the deficit. Dan Sullivan. Uh, has done the same. These are two people who are up in 2020, and and you don't hear any Tea Party rattling about 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 going after them. It's uh, it's a difficult situation, but again, we're facing exactly the same kind of problem in the state of Alaska, where the Tea Party popped up in the U.S. They got a lot of pushback from the business as usual Republicans. They got in, really didn't understand how the game worked, kind of got played. Uh, some of them got subsumed. The other ones kind of got kicked out. When Republicans got in power, we increased the size and scope of government, which, of course, is antithetical to what they believe. But we're seeing the same thing in the state of Alaska, less than 30 seconds. Well, it, during the Obama administration, the Tea Party rose to power because they were concerned about the size of the deficits. The CBO just did an estimate. Over the next 10 years, the deficits will exceed what they were during the Obama administration. So it, if we if we ever had the Tea Party, we need them back now. Absolutely. We need them, and we need them in, on a state-by-state -state basis, I think, at this point. We need to take a grassroots, and if we can get our house in order, maybe, just maybe... We can get the National House in order if we can get some of the states to play ball. I see this as kind of just being part and parcel of the same thing. We saw 
exactly the same thing happen at the local level, where you get somebody who's more fiscally minded, more conservative, who tries to make things happen, who tries to get in there, and it is the business as usual. It's The enemy is not necessarily the Democrats, per se. It's the business as usual Republicans who are the ones that are making all this stuff happen. It's Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, uh, the Republicans controlled Congress and the White House during the first two years uh, of the Trump administration. Deficits went up, uh, and now the Republicans still control the Senate, uh, and def- deficits are still are, and still control the White House, and deficits are going up further. I, I, I can't over I can't overstate how how huge these numbers are. During the Obama administration, the first four years of the Obama administration, we ran deficits that were greater than 5% of GDP. That's a huge number. It only occurred before that uh, in any sort of length of time during World War II, but it occurred during the first four years of the Obama administration. The Tea Party came in, got it under control, and moved those numbers well below uh, 5%. Now, with, the, with the, the, the tax cuts, with the two spending bills that, that uh, the Republican Congress has approved uh, uh, back-to-back over the, over the last two years, uh, and, and again with the tax bill, uh, we're moving back above 5% uh, of, of GDP in terms of our deficit uh, in two more years. Uh, and then it runs out as far as the eye can see. In fact, by 2029, the end of the two-year period, Deficits are up to seven percent uh, of GDP. These are the these are the kind of numbers that triggered the triggered the Tea Party, uh, or at least on the surface, people claim triggered the Tea Party uh, back in 2009, 2010, 2011. Uh, they're not uh, uh, moving uh, uh, individuals in the same way as a re- right now, at least. And as a result, the numbers are are growing. Uh, they're growing rapidly, as, as Trump would say, huge. They're huge numbers. They're huge. They're huge. Um, and, and part of what Jamie said, I also agree with. She go, He said that's also because the Tea Party was constantly being hit over the head with the racist and every other kind of club. And even you, I saw one of your posts. Somebody said <laughs> you, you posted the article from the New York Post about 10 years after the Tea Party, what's going on. And even one of your commenters, what it's almost as if the Tea Party never cared about the debt was primarily about white identity politics. What? I mean, this is the same kind of I mean, this it's it's like everything is it, it's ever it's about everything. But what it was really about, so to speak. Well, if that's what the problem, the challenge, Michael, is if that's what it's about, we're in that era again. If it was about the budget, we're in that era again. And people who were concerned about it at the time. People in Alaska and people elsewhere who were concerned about it at the time, if that's what it was about, they need to be concerned about it again because the numbers are there again. The deficits are there again. And it's the same sort of establishment, people that are voting for it, Don Young, Dan Sullivan, uh, uh, people that we've got uh, coming up in the 2020 election, they're the ones that are voting for uh, increasing the deficit. So if we've got, if we had concern about it in 2008, it's time to have concern about it again. It is because it's simple ar- arithmetic. We can't keep going on in the, in the way that we're going on now and expect that it's all going to, uh, you know, be butterflies and puppies in the end. Because eventually, this merry-go-round stops, and when the music stops, you don't want to be the guy without the chair. And unfortunately, that's us at this point. We're the one. We're going to be without a chair when the music stops. All the you know the elites and the and the. Uh, the, the Congress critters and everything else, they'll have some tax-sheltered whatever in Bermuda. Meanwhile, average Alaskans, average Americans will be the ones left holding the bag when that thing, when the yogurt hits the fan, and, and, and nobody needs that. What do we do from here, Brad? What do we do to, to fix this? Well, I, we've got to talk about it, and, and frankly, I think, you know, we need to think about what that means in Alaska in terms of, the, in terms of Don Young's campaign and, and Dan Sullivan's campaign. Thus far, uh, the Democrats that are running against them, or the independents, whatever they are, uh, are even more farther, farther to the left uh, than, than Young and Sullivan. So you really don't have uh, anybody out there right now who's bringing this issue uh, to the fore. But I think if the Tea Party was, was about spending, if they were about running deficits, and if that same sentiment exists today, I think there's a fertile ground out there for 
people to raise a challenge or for someone to raise raise a challenge on the on the conservative side, the fiscal conservative side, to both Young and Sullivan. Whether we see that and whether we see that movement uh, is yet to be seen. But the same sort of conditions, the same sort of soil in which the Tea Party was planted uh, in 2008, the same sort of fiscal soil in which the Tea Party arose in 2008 is out there right now. The same sort of deficits, the same sort of fiscal, fiscal uh, reckless fiscal policy is out, out there right now. And Don Young and Dan Sullivan are voting for it. Well, the only thing that I'm hearing on that is people saying people being frustrated and irritated because what they're saying is we tried that. We tried that with Murkowski. You know, we put a fiscal conservative up there. We got him all the way through the primary. And then, of course, the party submarine the whole deal on top of it, which, I, I you know, it's not not without merit uh, that they just feel like uh, it doesn't matter who we put up. It, it almost becomes an exercise in futility. And I think we've got to fight against that. Final thoughts, Brad. Well, the, 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 the numbers are out there. It's, it's flashing red. It's telling us we're heading into deficits that long term we can't handle. That's pushing the burden to, to, to down the road to future generations in a huge way um, and is going to lead to, to serious problems. It's even going to affect this generation in terms of pressure on, on, on making cuts to Social Security and Medicare uh, as this generation retires. So yeah. we, we, need, we need to take that on board, understand it. Uh, and if there, if the Tea Party was all about fiscal sanity back in, in the late 2000s, it needs to rise again, or the people that were involved in it need to become active again because we're going into the same conditions. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend, for coming on board and joining us. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.